Then on Monday, Family Day, February 18th at 12 p.m., we will have the Parashat Shavua class on that day. When usually we have it on Tuesday, on that week we're going to have it on Monday. And it's going to be part of uh, a lunch by Tom Tov Catering. Scoops of egg salad, <laughs> cream cheese, <laughs> tea and coffee, tea and cheap coffee. So please remember that the deadline to RSVP is, is Friday. by Friday. Can I do my job, Alan? Yeah. Good job. Thanks. I like the cartoon. I like the cartoon. Let's see. Alan. Let's see. Great. Okay, page four for four parashat Shuma. We have in this week's portion details that relate to the construction of the tabernacle. The tabernacle plays a significant role for us as Jews because eventually this temporary structure known as the tabernacle turns into a permanent temple. It takes time. It goes through stages because even as they entered into the land of Israel, the tabernacle remained as a mishkan. And they settle in different places. Gilgal, Shiloh, Nov, Givon. They settle in different places and they still retain, to some extent, this temporary structure. Eventually, they choose a location. God Almighty communicates that Jerusalem is that place, and they establish a temple in Jerusalem. A structure that becomes our hub, our spiritual hub. Until this day, we turn towards Jerusalem in prayer, and this Bet HaMikdash is our identity in many ways. We had not one, but two, due to the destruction. So this is indeed a very significant portion because the vessels described here are the ones that are going to be present in the Bet HaMikdash. Now, throughout the years we focused on a lot of the symbolism. What does this vessel symbolize? Why is it on the north side? Why is this one on the south side? Why is this one behind the partition? That's what we have focused on. But uh, today we're going to focus more on the differences between A, B, and C. So you're going to have to remember the A, B, and C. The A being the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Okay? B is going to be the first Bet HaMikdash, when some 400 and something years after the entrance of the land of Israel, finally, finally, Shlomo HaMelech is given the opportunity to construct this temple. That is the Bet HaMikdash HaRishon, the first temple. That is going to be our B. Okay. Unfortunately, it's destroyed, and when they return from the exile in Babylonia, they have the second Bet HaMikdash. For us, that is going to be the C. Okay, the A, B, C. Uh, what we're going to note is that actually there are similarities between the A and the C that do not apply to the B. In other words, there is some kind of relationship between the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and the second Bet HaMikdash, the one established by our ancestors who returned from Babylonia, led by Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel. There are going to be some level of similarities. That's what we're going to be addressing. Now, when we study our tradition, we, in general, try to take the rational approach to things. Mm -hmm. Right? That even a person without uh, the background, you know, education is important. Education is very, very important. And overall, we are quite successful with our education, right? If you see the next generation having a commitment 
to, to our Judaism, to our values, you've got to realize that overall we're doing okay. Now, when you want to transmit values to the next generation, right, our values, our traditions, you are always going to be dealing with the greatest challenge of all. How do you view those who are not members of your tradition? Right? How do you view those who are on the outside? Okay, now it could relate to those who are a little bit different than you, right? They wear different colored shirts than you, right? How, are they still Jewish, right? Are they still Jewish? Like uh, there was a joke that I heard from one of the Tversky's that among the, the chassidim, oh, this is a joke I heard from a chassid, so it's kosher, okay? <laughs> that among the chassidim, there was some groups, I don't know, bells, they have a ribbon. You know that when you have a, a black hat, it has a ribbon. By most chassidim, they keep the ribbon on the right side, and it's, you could, due to the fact that the brim doesn't move down, but it's completely round, you could choose where the ribbon is placed, okay? This is an important piece of information. <laughs> now, by most chassidim, by most chassidim, they keep the ribbon, I think it is on the right. But there was one group, there was one group that would keep the ribbon on the left. Right, left. So, it's noted that one of the members of that group that keeps the ribbon to the left, one time wanted to go into a neighborhood and wanted to do something that's not so appropriate so what he did was, is that he moved that where the ribbon is on the other side that they should think he's a goy. That was the explanation that was given. Okay? So we often have the challenge, how do you deal with those, how do you deal with those that are on the outside? As people of faith, we ask this question often, how do we view the non-Jewish world? Right? What is their role? And it is delicate. It is extremely delicate. You go ahead and you treat, you, you teach the next generation, right, that we are valuable and they are not, right? And you wake up in the morning and you declare and you are grateful to God Almighty that he made you Jewish, indicating that I am better than them. There's a danger there because they're going to look at the others as subhuman, not really, not real human beings. They have no value, they have no significance. And that is extremely problematic, extremely problematic. On the other hand, if you teach your children that they are just like us, that they are just the same, we have ethics, they have ethics, there's absolutely no difference between us, how on earth are you going to preserve our traditions? How are they going to be transmitted if there is no appreciation of what we are about? It is not easy. It's quite, de it, it's delicate, and it is something we have to be mindful of. And obviously, if you like stepping back and looking at the Jewish world of today as a sociologist, it's not good to do it often. We have to practice our Judaism and live it. But sometimes we step back and we look at the Jewish world, and you look at different groups, and you realize that people deal with it differently. By some, indeed, there is that problem. We are more human than them. They're less human. And the results are no good. And then you look at other groups and you realize that they are trying to teach, right? Humanism to their children, right? Egalitarian approaches. How are we going to preserve our Judaism? This is a delicate area. And actually, what we are going to do as we study uh, this Parsha, and when we're going to be talking about the construction of the tabernacle, we're going to keep in mind the ABC. What's the ABC? Good, good. Class is following well. So we're going to keep that in mind. We're going to realize that we are touching upon this, this delicate, delicate area in Jewish thought. Now, there's a section in the Talmud. The, there's a section of a tractate called Yuma, which we have the privilege, some of us here study it Thursday night. And tractate Yuma talks about the tablets and the holy ark that was no longer there during the second temple period. It was gone. You know the holy ark is gone? Where is it? 
people have been looking for it, like Indiana Jones, right, and others. Where is the holy ark? And every once in a while, you're going to find an article that's in Ethiopia, or it's in the Vatican, or it's hiding in some kind of tunnel under the Temple Mount. Where is it indeed? So, as a good Jewish question, there has to be a there has to be a disagreement. This cannot, that is Jewish, right? There has to be a disagreement where it landed up. Now, the Talmud shares one opinion that it actually was left in Babylonia. It was taken and left there. Then there's an opinion in the Talmud that under the Holy of Holies, in the Temple Mount, Solomon himself created a chamber to conceal it, knowing that one day it indeed will have to be concealed because invaders are going to take over the area. Okay, so there's a chamber. And there are many, even if you make, do the tours, under, you know, the Kotel, the Kotel tours, that, how do they call them? The tunnels. Tunnels. tunnel tours. There's one section where they, at least the tour guide is very confident, that <laughs> where you stand right now, you are facing the area that corresponds to the Holy Ark. So stand there, uh, meditate. So indeed they are confident about that. But then there's a third opinion that is mentioned in the Talmud. The Talmud shares with us a story that there were Kohanim doing their job in a specific chamber. They had a very interesting job that the wood that was used to burn on the altar had to be worm free. So there were Kohanim who were designated to removing the worms from the wood. Today they probably would have at a kosher supermarket, Bodek wood. It cost like $20 a small piece. But in those days, they didn't have that option, so they had these Kohanim that were designated worm clears from the wood. And the Talmud shares with us a story that one time one of them was there and he noticed that one of the balatot, if you've been to Israel, you know what that is, that one of uh, the stove, one of the tiles was out of place, and he went to look and he immediately died. And it became clear to the other Kohanim, and to the rabbis <coughs> at the time, that in that area where he looked and he shouldn't have looked, were, was the Holy Ark. The Holy Ark was concealed. It was not to be seen during the second temple period. Not to be seen. Okay? That's statement number one. And if you remember our columns, this is a statement that relates to column B. C, thank you, column C, okay? Meaning the time of the second temple period. Now, the Talmud has a little bit of an issue, a little bit of a problem with this, because we are told that during the first temple period, column B, they actually had a practice that when the nation would come to Jerusalem, they wanted to inspire them about the close relationship they have with God Almighty, and what they would do is that they would open the doors of the Holy of Holies and roll up the curtains that block the view of that area of the temple. And members of the nation were able to look into the Holy of Holies to see the close relationship the people of Israel have with God by looking at the Kerubim, which seems to indicate that it's not such a problem for the Jewish people to go ahead and see this holy vessel. So, in column B, it's not so problematic. It's, it is as if we are comfortable with God Almighty. And then the Talmud adds to this problem because during the period of the years of the wilderness, when they had a Mishkan, A, when they needed to transport the holy vessels from location to location, they had the Kohanim going into the structure of the tabernacle and they would conceal these vessels in these garments that no one should look at it as they are being transported. So when they were transported, they were covered, indicating that we do have this sensitivity. So there's a, a lack of clarity here of what exactly is happening. Are we yes sensitive to the fact that the, the non-Kohanim should, should see the vessels? Are we not sensitive? The Talmud struggles with this issue. And the Talmud tells us that you should know that we could compare 
the relationship of the people of Israel to God Almighty to the Chosen Kala. To the Chosen Kala. You have a young couple that meet, right? And they spend time together. So the young lady is not so comfortable yet with her future husband, right? And she's careful to, you know, to cover herself, not to share everything, you know, she's not going to chew in front of him. Whatever it is, there's a level of sensitivity <laughs> that she has because she wants to keep this identity. They're not so close yet. On the other hand, when they're married, right, all that is out the window, right? There's no, there's no concern. What? I'm going to go ahead. And they're, they're a unit. They're one. And believe it or not, we consider that level of comfort as a sign of a complete <coughs> connection. They are one unit. Therefore, the Talmud notes, during the years of the tabernacle, when they were in the wilderness, in column A, they couldn't see the holy ark because the relationship that we have with God was still new. It was in the developing stages. The holy ark cannot be seen. It would overwhelm them. It was concealed. When they settle in Jerusalem during the period of the first temple, then already they're a married couple. They're a married couple. The vessels could be seen. Now, that doesn't settle all the issues because the story of the priest who saw the Holy Ark and was overwhelmed seems to indicate that when they are in column C, then again, there's this Distance, so the Talmud struggles with it, so the Talmud uses the following words that you should know. That once they are quote-unquote divorced, they return to stage A. In other words, due to the fact that during the Second Temple period they don't have the Holy Ark, due to the fact that there's this distance again between the people of Israel and God Almighty, you have to remember that during the Second Temple period, our return to Israel is not a complete return. Our relationship with God is limited. We don't have prophecy. The majority of the people of Israel are not back in the land of Israel. There is a gap between them, so therefore they return to stage A regarding this matter that they don't feel comfortable seeing the holy vessels. Okay? Keep this information in mind. Okay? And with, with that, we could begin or return back to our journey the relationship between the people of Israel and the nations of the world. Now, we know very well that if you are a participant, a financial participant in an endeavor, you are indeed an owner or a member. You know, the, I, I shared the story years ago that uh, my, my, my family develop, developed this relationship with a woman by the name of Florence Gawkin. Florence Gawkin. And Florence Gawkin came into uh, our, our, our life when I was about 11 years old. And she came, she came to our house for a Shabbos meal. And the reason Florence came to uh, a Shabbos meal was she was going through a major tragedy with a son of hers. Florence was, uh, it was a very active New York Jew. And obviously, like a good Jew in New York, very involved in liberal causes. And for example, she was extremely close with the mayor at the time, a fellow by the name of David Dinkins, if you remember him. Right. And extremely liberal as a good Jew should be. And for her, what her children would do was not important. The main thing is that they should find meaning and be happy. So one of them moved, I think, to California to do who knows what, to live all kind of interesting lifestyles. Everything was acceptable, but there was one choice of her son Bill that was unacceptable to her, that indeed was a tragedy. He made his way to Yerushalayim, he went to a yeshiva, and he decided to become orthodox. And that was one tragedy that, that already, you know, there's a limit to what a liberal Jew is willing to accept. So Florence, Florence Gawkin gets on a plane and made her way to Orsamach to be sure that she's going to attract her son from this environment. And she met the heads of the yeshiva. And she put a lot of energy and effort. And it was decided that, you know what, uh, perhaps to deal with her, she should be invited to our house for a Friday night meal. 
And indeed, she came. She came. And we had an incredible Shabbos meal with her. It was fascinating. It was interesting. My parents enjoyed it. And she was a brilliant woman. The, the head of the yeshiva actually what mentioned to my father that he would be so much happier if he could sell and build back and keep Florence in the yeshiva. <laughs> <laughs> because she really was a brilliant woman who comprehended and understood everything. <laughs> And we, we developed this relationship with her, and she became part of our family. There was not a simcha, a wedding, bar mitzvah. She was there at every single uh, simcha. It, she did not, uh, you know, become quote-unquote orthodox, but she was far more <coughs> accepting suddenly, because she noted that there are some people who are indeed religious that are not completely crazy. So the idea of her son being a member of this cult was acceptable to her. Fine, that's the story. Now, sitting at my brother's bar mitzvah, so this is about a decade later, uh, she's sitting with the family, with my grandfather, and she noted that she, she sees it as quite problematic that in our tradition, all Jews are supposed to give the half shekel. You know that? That every single Jew during the temple period uh, were supposed to participate in this fundraiser that was done to bring the s continual sacrifices. And she felt this is not appropriate. What would a, a liberal Jew believe is the proper way of raising funds for the temple? You come with your tax returns, right? And if you earn more, you should be giving more. You earn less, society should be taking care of it. Why are we demanding from the poor the half a shekel? This was her question. My grandfather responded with a letter. You have a copy of that letter. And my, my grandfather noted that the question's a good one, but at the same time you have to realize the temple and the institutions that bring us together belong to all Jews. It would be significantly problematic if you're going to go ahead and have the temple only belonging to the wealthy. Imagine if you have a situation that the poor person coming to Jerusalem looks at that structure and thinks, well, you know, it's the Goldberg Mizbeach, because obviously there's going to be a plaque on it, right? So it's the Goldberg Mizbeach, so how can the sacrifices have anything to do with me if I did not make that donation? So therefore, what the Torah wants is that every single Jew should feel the temple, the service, the activity, the connection to God belongs to all of us. And therefore, yes, perhaps it wasn't easy to put together that half shekel, but you knew that you are a member. The temple does not just belong to the Asherim, to the wealthy. This was the point that he made. So we understand very well when we begin this parsha, the Kuli Truma, make a donation. This is not just a donation. This is a demand, as we shall see, that every single person becomes a partner in the beginning of the temple, in the building of the temple. Fine? Piece of information that's important? Let's return now, and I hope we are able to go back to our A, B, C. And the question is going to be, who participated in the building of A, B, and C? When it comes to the Mishkan, to the tabernacle, the Kholi Truma, it is only members of Klal Israel. When it comes to the building of C, the second temple, we are told that the funds were raised by the Jewish people. And when there were outsiders in the book of Ezra, we are told that when there were outsiders that wanted to donate and be partners of the building, they were told, Ma leave You guys have nothing, you have no place in the building of a temple. On the other hand, when it comes to the first temple of King Solomon, you've heard of the name Hiram, mm -hmm. he was a partner. He sent wood from the Lebanon. There was partnership from members of other nations in the building of the tabernacle. What's the idea behind it? So it appears that while the purpose of the Mishkan is, yes, the relationship that we have with God Almighty through this tabernacle, and the relationship of the second temple when we are in decline, when we focus more on our own personal growth, yes, the members that make the contribution are members of our people. On the other hand, when it comes to the first temple of Solomon, this was for humanity. And therefore, members of the human race were partners in the building. Okay? 
And therefore, when we talk about uh, the, the fact that we identify the temple as beti bet filai kare lecholo amim, right? It's not just for the Jews. It's for members of the human race. And you see it in Israel. Keep your eyes open. Tourism to Israel, right? Look at the numbers. They're not all Jewish, right? You, you know very well. You've been there. You saw members of other nations. And many of them have a deep appreciation of what the state of Israel is about, what the Jewish people are about, what the relationship of to God Almighty is about. It is this idea of the Temple of Solomon. King Shlomo HaMelech had a vision that this is a structure for humanity. And therefore, they could be participants, OK? So it's a shift that's occurring between a, B, and C. Now this clarifies uh, a, few, a few other things. You know, we talk about gifts to the Kohanim and Levi'im in our tradition often. Truma and Ma'aser. Let's talk about the Ma'aser that's given to the Levites. What percentage is Ma'aser? Ten. Ten. And even the word itself indicates Eser. Me'eser. Now, the truma itself, it's quite fascinating that when we are told that we're supposed to give to the Kohanim, so we are told that when you give the Kohen, you choose what percentage you want to give him. If you want, you could give him one out of 40 from your yield. If you want, you could give him one out of 50, one out of 60, which is fascinating that when you're dealing with the Levi, you're given a precise amount. When you're dealing with the Kohen, we are told, you choose how much to give. Now, what's the logic behind it? So we talked about the fact that there are different personalities. And there are people that are happy to get what they deserve, right? People of precision, people of numbers. And then there are peoples of emotion. And when it comes to our educators and people that inspire us, we need both personalities, right? You need people of precision. You need people that know the exact law, that when, for example, come Pesach time and you want to know how much matzah to eat, you want to go ahead and get a message of a precise amount. You want to go ahead and figure out the height of a sukkah. You need people that deal with precision, right? People that are good with the dry law. But Judaism cannot be transmitted only with the dry law. You need people of the spirit that inspire you, people of emotion. The Kohanim in general were people of emotion. The Levi'im, again, as a concept, were people of precision. And therefore, when you go ahead and give them gifts, for the Levi, he doesn't need a, 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 a sign of appreciation. For the Levi, he's satisfied getting that 10%. The Kohen, the idea that you have the option of giving different amounts, and you choose to give the, more, the larger, the greater amount, is a sign of appreciation for people of emotion. That's very important. You know that when it comes for example, to teachers, right? And they get a salary, but if the teacher finds in his box in school a Starbucks card for $10, that means, it's, it means a lot to them. And you think about it, what's the logic behind it? Right? What's, what's, what? A $10 when you're dealing with this answer is, the sign of appreciation touches some people. And I think that for the Kohanim, or people that uh, uh, symbolize th that way of, uh, of, of thinking and living, it is far more effective for the emotional person getting that extra gift when the appreciation is shown is far more effective than the people that work with the system of precision, meaning the Levi'im. Now, knowing that we have this idea of truma and ma'aser, if we are supposed to be a light upon the nations, if we are supposed to be those that inspire the world, right, the people of Israel, you have to keep in mind that this role, the role of inspiring through action and the role of teaching with you know, precise measurements, both of them relate to us, the Jewish people. And with that, I'll share with you one more piece of information. I hope I'm not making this too technical. You're familiar with the menorah, the holy uh, candelabra. candelabra that was in the Beit HaMikdash. Did you know that in the temple of Shlomo, there were 10 additional ones that he added to the one that was handed down by Moshe. It's not, it's not really, it's, it's quite fascinating that it appears in the Book of Kings. And it talks about Shlomo HaMelech building the temple. And we are told that he's not satisfied with one, he, make, he brings 10 more into the picture. And you ask yourself, what's the idea behind it? 
And why is it that during the Second Temple period they had no interest in, you know, have no record of them having it during the Second Temple period? Many of you visited Italy and you were in Rome, right? And you saw the Arch of Titus. You don't see them schlepping ten. What are they schlepping? Only one. Why is it that King Solomon has the additional ten? So I'll tell you. The people of Israel, we are like the truma. In other words, we are like the chosen of the nations. And the role of being chosen is not for ourselves, but to have an impact on the world. When King Solomon wants to build a temple that it is not just for that me'eser, not just for the chosen one, but for humanity, what does he do? He increases those vessels, not just the menorah, but the shulchan as well. He increases them by ten to symbolize the idea that this is a temple for all nations. Okay? And this really will bring it, uh, I, I believe so, all together, that when it comes to the first, to the Mishkan, A, and when it comes to C, to the second temple, that was very Jewish. It was only for our people. Shlomo HaMelech had a vision that it is for humanity, and due to the fact that it was for humanity, therefore, number one, the, f the funds that came in to build it were from all members of the human race. Everyone belongs to everyone. When it comes to these vessels, when it comes to these vessels that symbolize the relationship, not just one for the people of Israel, multiply it by ten because you want to symbolize and you want to show that this really is a temple for all members of the human race. So these are key pieces of information that will give us a little bit of an understanding. And there's one more. You know, we, we talk about Hamavdil, we end our week. We end our week or we end our Shabbat and we begin our week with Hamavdil. In Kodesh Lachor, all Lachoshim. It's significant to know that there are partitions, right? There are differences between ourselves and the nations of the world, and it's an important step. Yes. Not that we're better, but that right, we, have a different, we have a different role. Now, the word parochet, curtain, the word parochet, is used in the Torah as a partition. And the whole idea of a parochet is partition. Now, in the wilderness, they had the Holy of Holies and they had the Holy section. In between them, there was a curtain. During the second temple period, they actually also had a curtain dividing the Holy of Holies and the Holy. On the other hand, during the first temple period, what did they have? They had doors. They had doors in between. It was a wall with a door. When a door symbolizes a connection, you open your door, you could come in. A curtain always symbolizes partition. When, by, it, when in the wilderness, right, the Jewish people were in the process of maturing, figuring out their identity, the partition was there to show that you are still developing your own unique role. Focus now on the fact that there's a partition. The first temple, which was more of an ideal situation, it was the concept of a door. We welcome everyone, right? We feel a connection to humanity. What's interesting to note is that during the second temple period, there was not one partition. Actually, they had two curtains in between the Holy of Holies and the Holy. Two curtains. And the rabbis know that the reason they had two curtains was because they did not know regarding the status of the sanctity of that area, they kept two. And it symbolizes an idea as well, you know, the, 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 there was a story I've shared here of there was a psychologist rabbi in Israel by the name of Hoffman and he went through the uh, he went through the yeshiva system he was a mechavra yeshiva and at some point you know eventually he had to go out and work and he got a job as a, as a therapist in the jails of Israel he made his way back to the yeshiva once to visit his, the head of his yeshiva, or by Sarna. And when he was in, as he is interacting with his uh, Rosh Yeshiva, he indicated to Rabbi Sarna that he felt a level of guilt that he had to leave the yeshiva and quote-unquote enter into the workforce, right? And he's not sitting and learning. Now, Rabbi Sarna said to him, young man, you should listen, listen to me carefully. You, you, are on a daily basis, assisting people in becoming better. You are dealing with 
with pe members of our society that are going through a tremendous challenge, difficulty, and you are working with them. If you have to apologize to me for leaving the yeshiva and doing what you are doing, we as an institution have failed. In other words, if a yeshiva is, creates graduates who do not understand that if you are having a positive impact on the world, right, that if you are helping people in need, if you do not have an appreciation of what you are achieving, we have failed as an institution. This is an incredible story that it is always important in our faith to realize that when you have an impact on the world, you are doing good. And you remember the story a couple decades ago, this, I think it was, it was Feuerstein, somewhere in New England, that he had a, a textile facility, was it? Yeah. And it burned down, and he did not have a, a legal obligation to pay to pay his workers, correct? And he nevertheless did, and it reached the media, and it was a tremendous Kiddush Hashem, right? Of a Jew doing, you know, look, look, this is what Jewish values is about, right? Now, we always believe in having an impact on the world. We always believe at the same time that we have to focus on our own. We have to be sure that the next generation retains a commitment and interest in Judaism. And I do believe that sometimes we enter into a gray area where we ask ourselves, what should we be doing? In other words, imagine if you have a person that uh, could inspire 1,000 Gentiles, right? Which has value and inspire them to become better people. And as a result of that, they're gonna develop an appreciation for Judaism. Or he could become a head of a school in a small town where he's gonna be impacting 50 Jewish students. So how do you make that decision? Imagine that question is brought to you, right? I could go ahead and do a Kiddush Hashem if I have a thousand people every year being inspired. I'm going to open this institution uh, that's going to teach the Noahite laws. And I'm going to inspire people about how open, about, about how rational Judaism is and how righteous it is. Or should I focus on an institution that I'm going to only teach one twentieth of it, but within the Jewish world? Which one do you go for? Right? There's this area that, this partition that exists between the people of Israel and the nations, it's not always, always clear. And I think that that relates a little bit to the idea that during the second temple period, right, when they had this partition, they weren't exactly sure where to place it. You don't know exactly where the boundaries are. That's, that's basically the message. Partition, yes. Where do you place it? That is a little bit of... The question mark. Anyway, what we have from this uh, a little bit different class is the idea of the purpose of the first temple. It's interesting to note that we talk often about the Valojan Yeshiva. yeshiva. Why do we talk about the Valojan Yeshiva? It's considered the father of the modern day Yeshiva. When historically, right, if you would visit European communities from you know the 11th, 12th, 13th century on, there were yeshivot, but it was always local. The local rabbi would have, take a few of the young, talented students in town, and they would see him, they would observe him interacting with members of the community, they would see him studying, they would deal with questions, and they would become the next generation of rabbis. Now, the benefit of such a system was that they always saw practical Judaism. They never practiced theoretical Judaism, meaning they weren't in an institution that was detached from society where they could believe that everything is in its ideal form. They dealt with practical questions. So they saw the, the rabbi in town being lenient with a chicken for the poor person. So therefore, when they dealt with a halachic issue in text that relates to chickens, they understood very well that we have to find a leniency for the poor person. Something changes in the 19th century where you have the modern day yeshiva, and the result is that today, in some yeshivot, they are detached from a community completely. And the result is that they keep very high standards and are going to have difficulty guiding communities that don't have those standards because they did not have that training. So often, the Valojan yeshiva is considered the father of that modern-day manifestation of the yeshiva, even though it is quite different because the Valojan yeshiva's heads were actually the rabbis of town. In the second half of the 19th century, there was a rabbi, Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, and he had the yeshiva. 
And I did something very interesting with the computer. Today you have tools and you could figure out the way of thinking of rabbis with tools that people did not have in the past. And I did the following. You're very familiar with the term or lagoim, right? It's used a lot, it's used a lot. Very, very popular uh, perhaps by the reform and conservative movement, a little bit less by us, and that's the result that there, by them there's a focus of tikkun olam. By us there is a focus on, yes, tikkun olam, but it has to be b'malchut shakai. It has to be with understanding that there is a God. And if you want to understand there's a God, there has to be focus on growth within the Jewish world. Once there's growth within the Jewish world and understanding of what we are about, then we can work on being a light upon the nations. Now, the words or la goim actually do not appear in Tanakh. The actual words are that in the verse Yishayahu says that one day will be, or goim will be a light indeed upon the nations. It's a very small variation, but or goim. So I was curious, I was curious. I looked at the commentators of the past few centuries and I wanted to know who focuses on using those words a lot and which commentator doesn't, okay? And that tells you a lot about the person. If someone, for him, these verses, these words that indicate that we are there for humanity is insignificant, what does that indicate? Their only interest is self-development from within, which is obviously important. If there is a commentator who does mention it, obviously it's, it plays a significant role for him. So what was quite fascinating is that almost all commentators, unless they are commentators on the text itself, don't focus on it. Don't bring it down. Who does, dozens of times, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. And he uses these words, for example, he notes that you should know that there are many regions that before the Jewish people arrived there, they were insignificant. Right? Think of Eastern Europe. Right? You, know, you know about the cultures of Eastern Europe of the 12th and 13th century? Right? Do we find any great minds that came up? You're going to say, okay, Copernicus, but overall, they did not, no great contribution has come. Or think about uh, France. France, you know what the Rambam writes about France? that you can't, it's hard to make a brach on France because they have pigs running around everywhere. In other words, these are very primitive societies a thousand years ago. And then suddenly the Jewish people arrive and something changes. Something changes when the Jews arrive. When you talk about the fact, what was the most advanced country in the world in the 16th century, you talk about Turkey. Who was there? The Jews were in Turkey at the time. So notes, notes, not nativ, you want to understand that? That is because we have the mission of being le'or goim, to have an impact on the world. He also notes, for example, if you want to understand why so much of our history is outside of Israel, so he states, that is because we have a concern. We have to have an impact on the world. That's what we are here for. We are indeed a light. Okay? So the first temple period, the temp temple of Shlomo HaMelech, a time when we think and we declare this is a house for all nations, you are all welcome to make your donations, right? Not, we don't want a partition, because the partition symbolizes separation. We want doors. That is a fundamental part of our religion, and it is quite fascinating that someone that is known as the father of the modern-day yeshiva, the institution that wants to close out or focus on the walls, is the one that is a reminder. We have a significant role and impact upon the world. So this is what we have, again, a little bit different than what we do traditionally, mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully, uh, uh, ho hopefully we could uh, gain uh, a little bit from this idea that you have to keep things balanced, that if we have an ABC in our history, we have a structure that focuses on our own growth, and we have a structure that focuses on impact on the world, we have to do both. How to balance it, good luck. Hopefully the educators <laughs> of the next generation uh, have answers to it, uh, but the concept still remains. Thank you for listening to this class, and have a wonderful day. Sure.